Ethiopia. So the question is, people or animals, you have to keep people away from endangered species. Born Free has a number of projects that look specifically at this issue. They fall under what we call our Global Friends Agenda. A school on the fringe of Amboseli National Park in Kenya, famous for its elephants, of course, used to have 80 pupils. It had three part-time teachers. The roll call was falling. The buildings looked like they'd been victims of a firestorm. The dormitory being closed after mixing teenage boys with teenage girls in an unsupervised environment which had led, of course, to predictable but nevertheless tragic consequences. Students stayed away, particularly the girls. Today, newly refurbished classrooms, a dormitory for girls, one soon for the boys, a matron, a cookhouse, toilets. These entice three times the number of pupils to the school. Even the teacher's own children now attend. Then there's the community near Ngamba Island, a chimpanzee sanctuary in Entebbe, Uganda. Couldn't attract a single government-trained teacher, lack of staff housing. Then the villagers in Dincho in Ethiopia near the Bali Mountains, home of the endangered Ethiopian wolf, celebrate annual Wolf Day, but they've got nowhere to to hold their celebrations. The women living in one community on the borders of Kahuzi Biega National Park in eastern DRC, eastern lowland gorillas, I'm just trying to pull in the animals here, they have no jobs. Uh, They have no prospects. They're subject to killings, rape, looting, and they have no way of generating an income. I could go on, but what's my point? Born Free works with all these communities, building new classrooms, new toilet blocks, new dormitories, new kitchens, establishing microfinance operations, and in the case of those Ethiopian villages of Dincho, we've built a new sports stadium, complete with grandstand flags and changing rooms. Why? Because we fundamentally believe that given the opportunity, people are frequently not part of the problem, they're often part of the solution. And through Global Friends, they're beginning to see wildlife, including endangered species, as a benefit. So you're all saying, why am I not sitting over there with Bill and Mary on the other side of the debate? After all, that's what they want. They want equity. They want empowerment. They want to relieve poverty, improve opportunity. And so do I. But what about the animals? I have a quick suggestion. Next time you have an opportunity, take a look at a map of the world's protected areas, national parks and reserves, and now take another map of human population presence and overlay the two. Uncannily, or not, you will find there is an obvious relationship. I actually have the maps on the desk here, so you can come up and have a look at them afterwards. Outside the polar regions, the areas of the world where human footprint is lightest frequently correlate with the areas that have been accorded a high level of conservation status. And according to the IUCN, it's in these conservation areas some of the most significant levels of biodiversity are still to be found. 10 to 12% of the world's surface, which is protected, contains representation of perhaps 75% of our biodiversity. These are the core zones without which all else, in my view, is at risk. This tells me something. If It tells me that if we want to conserve and protect species, including endangered and threatened species, as part of dynamic and evolving ecosystems, then we'd better be very careful about the impact of humans on those core zones. I'm going to come back on Bill's points in in a rebuttal later, so I'll stick with this for the moment. The patchwork of human activity, farming, agroforestry, industry, residential construction, roads, mining, and more, in some cases runs right up to the boundary of those protected areas, giving us a clear vision of what would happen if the boundaries came down and those activities, even some of them, were permitted to infiltrate. Many of you will have seen for yourselves, I know for sure that I have, places in Kenya from where I returned only last week where the boundary between a protected area in which human exploitation is strictly limited and contiguous land where there's a multi-zonal land use strategy is where that strategy is deployed, the boundary is stark. You can see it with the naked eye. Undisturbed vegetation, tree cover, wild animals on the one hand, secondary vegetation, significant erosion, domestic livestock, houses, roads on the other, within feet of each other. Now, some people might say, as I think Bill did, that what I'm advocating is effective the old-fashioned fortress conservation mentality. I totally disagree. In truth, I think it's the only strategy that stands a chance of delivering our objective of maintaining the majority of the world's current biodiversity, whether it's terrestrial or marine. An integrated approach, an alternative? I think not. Think of those maps again. A mosaic of human use outside protected areas leads to massive reductions in biodiversity. 
Species that are not beneficial to people are actively removed in favor of species that have a greater, greater added value to us. As Valmik says, if tigers and people don't mix, then the tigers will go. Some have suggested, can't help do this because I'm in Bristol, that zoos are the answer, not for me. Ex situ captive breeding of threatened species is fraught with problems and historically has delivered little. Weighed against the many millions of pounds these institutions cost, what would the 60 million that Bristol is planning to spend on the new 200 acre site do for wildlife in the wild? The mind boggles. Compare that with the 60,000 pounds that Senegal spent on field conservation in the entire country's national park system in 2006. That's 10,000 square kilometers, by the way. What indeed would that sort of money, almost as much as, as was raised by Band-Aid, do for poverty relief? After all, that's what is really at the root of this discussion. There are millions and millions of poor people, grindingly poor people, who live along the borders of protected areas. What seems to underpin the arguments of many who would accommodate people at the expense of animals is that in some way this strategy will have a major impact on poverty relief. It won't. Good governance, debt relief, fairer, trade, fairer prices for goods, more equitable sharing of wealth, tackling corruption, better education, clean water, improved health, slowing population growth, reversing desertification, controlling logging, sorting out a safe, secure, and above all fair global financial system that doesn't reward the few while risking the many, ending armed conflict, prioritizing expenditure, the Hubble Space Telescope, cost a mind-numbing $2.5 billion. Improving the West Coast Main Line will cost a startling £8 billion. That's £123 for every man, woman, and child in this country. The, whatever that thing is called, the Large Hadron Collider costs a developing country GDP swallowing $16 billion. These can all contribute to poverty relief. Opening up the borders of the world's fragile network of protected areas will not. And I'm coming to my closing remarks. Within a few short years, the ecosystem services of those areas will be damaged beyond repair. The forest will be gone, the water will be siphoned off, the minerals will be extracted, the wild animals would be eaten, traded, or shot. And the people who live in those areas, they would quickly be joined by many others understandably looking for short-term benefits, thereby accelerating the process of irreversible change. The result would be exactly what we can see with our own eyes in thousands of locations outside parks and reserves, the patchwork of multiple land use from which there is no return. The impact of this change would not just be felt in the parks and reserves. When the forest goes, then the water, the soil are seriously impacted, and city dwellers hundreds of miles away see their water supply reduced, increased risk of flooding, soil erosion. You know the story. A hundred years ago, across much of the planet, Islands of people were surrounded by seas of largely undisturbed natural habitat and wild animals. The human population stood at 1.7 billion 100 years ago. Today, it is 6.5. 35 years ago, the population of Kenya was 7 million. Today, it's past 30. It's now a sea of humanity swirling around islands of wildlife, each high tide threatening to wash some more away. And maybe that's what will happen. Maybe it is all beyond our control, that all we're doing is fighting a rearguard action that will merely slow the rate of decline but fail to halt it. And would it matter anyway? It would appear that as a species we're so hell-bent on self-destruction that no words or counsel can divert us from that destiny. Maybe if we say it enough times we'll convince ourselves that it's okay just to open up the borders. I don't think so. Let's hope that we've reached a point where being old, some of us, we have become wise and become the change we wish to see. With compassion, with understanding, by reaching out, we can bring hope to the world's poor. And yes, we can help ensure the survival of endangered and threatened species by keeping people out, at least for now. Thank you. I ask you to support the motion.